FM News Talk 97.1. On Demand Audio. Jimmy Carafano. <laughs> Jim Carafano. There is something that you can do, you personally as an individual, to make the world safer for your children and your grandchildren. And that is listen to Almond in the Morning. What's going on, Brother Jim? You ready for your citizenship test? Uh, <laughs> yes. What okay, is what is today? June 3rd. What is it? I don't know. The day before. Really? Seriously? Huh. No. Why would you do that to me? National Donut Day. Oh. Oh, gee. Oh, he's not even a patriot. Make uh, it up. Listen, I know, I know, I know uh, Flag Day, and I know all these things that happen during the <laughs> that summer. That one's coming up and soon. You know, what you, know? you know what you do know? Three days from now, June 6th, right? 72nd anniversary of D-Day. Of course. Mm-hmm. Yes. Means a kid that was 18 years old that scrambled up the, the bluffs in Omaha Beach is 90 years old today. Wow. And I guarantee you, if you could find that 90-year-old and sit him down in a chair, he could tell you every moment that he lived that day on the beach with the clarity as if it had happened five minutes ago. You know, Jim, I've told this story before, and it was fascinating when I ran into actually a uh, an offspring of one of these guys on uh, at, at D-Day Normandy. And she says that every time, it was talked about her dad, and she said it was interesting because the, the, my dad wouldn't talk a lot about it. Like, these guys wouldn't generally just sit down at a dinner table and start talking about their time. But she said sometimes, like, for instance, in when it when it was cold and drizzly, my dad would just sit out and stare out of the window, and I knew what he was doing. He was because that's exactly right. what it was like on D Day. It was drizzly, cold, right. foggy, and that's it, it was the same way with uh, a person whose dad was in the Battle of the Bulge. She said every time that it would be one of these kind of uh, light, snowy, flaky days, my dad would just sit there and stare out the window. Hey, it's crazy. Real quick, so today's a news story. We lost um, five uh, soldiers at Fort Hood, Texas, uh, drowned when a vehicle slipped over, and uh, four other guys are missing. But what I think is so great, those guys and their sacrifice is every bit as meaningful as important to the, the 2,500 that died on D-Day and the 70,000 that stormed the beach. Because anybody that puts on an American uniform and protects us, they are... They are, every one of them, every year since the founding of the country, they are all the greatest generation. Yeah, I I agree with you. In fact, we had, uh, this was not the first time this season that we lost a group of soldiers. Uh, This time, that was in Fort Hood. We lost some guys here in Missouri, and uh, it it was uh, in in a flood. Their their, their truck was washed away. So, Yeah. yeah. Wow. So they're out there. They're training. They're, they're, you know, risking their lives every day. You know, we lost one of our Blue Angels yesterday too. Yeah, that was rough. Actually, I got a great. Uh, I got a great analyst you should get on sometime. His name is J.V. Venable. He's a former uh, Blue Angel and a former F-16 pilot. And uh, if it flies, he knows everything about it. He's been busy all morning talking about that on the radio. Yeah, he was. It was a Marine Captain Jeff Cuss, and he was just uh, here in St. Louis couple of weeks ago for the air show. Yeah, we actually had two, two pilots um, yesterday. One was the Blue Angel thing, and the other one was a, another a training accident. So. Yeah, and, and but but he popped out, right? Uh, I, I Well, I know there were two crashes. I thought they both died, but oh, maybe I'm wrong. I, I think it was just one. I think he was okay. able to eject. But this okay, was, you're right. You're right. Two crashes, one guy died. Yeah, you're but right. this was a, right. a, apparently a mechanical error or something. Right, right, but right. Who knows? Yeah. But, yeah, and, they flew and, into the guy flew into the mountain or something. And then and on, the, on the positive end, though, did you see the story about this Navy guy treading water for 20 hours in the Gulf of Mexico? Yeah. And he, and, and he survived. He was treading water 20 hours. Well, the, the guys on the Indianapolis, um, there's a great new documentary coming out on the USS Indianapolis. You know, that was the, the, the ship that delivered the plane and the atomic bombs. So they were coming back under radio silence. The ship got torpedoed. It, it went down. 800 men died at sea. Some of them got eaten by sharks. But those guys treaded water for days. Wow. Crazy stuff. Well, and I was told that just Navy training, you tread water for five hours. Yeah. I, I can't even... 
I can sit in front of the TV. I can't even stay awake that long. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And then I got another mo- note from a guy over at Boeing, and he said, uh, Mark, and he said, salt water is a little easier to float in, and they also train them to take their pants or shirt off, tie the legs shut. I know how to do that. And fill the pants with air and use it to float. I learned that at West Point. Oh, you did? I did, yes. They taught us that. Wow. So can, can I tell you a funny story? Yes. So the other thing they taught us is how to bob and travel. So that's when you're crossing like a river or something, right? And and the water is over your head. You, what you do is you sink to the bottom, and then you pop to the top, get a breath of air, and then you just kind of bob like that across the river, right? So they're they're saying, okay, so we're going to practice this in the pool. So we're doing this in the pool, you know, we're going down, and we're it's pretty easy. And they said, okay, now we're going to grade it. And they gave us this pack with this like 40 pounds of concrete in it, right? So I... So I like sinking to the bottom like a rock, and then I'm coming up to get my air, and my like my eyes barely break the surface, and then wow. I go back down. And oh. I'm like, so I couldn't actually <laughs> breathe. It was horrible, but but yet I lived. Yeah, you did. Hey, by the way, when is that documentary about the Indianapolis coming out? Um, well, it's playing in the GI Film Festival, uh, which actually was just last week. So, oh, okay. Um, yeah, so it should be coming out in general. It's just. Great, they had all these, because a lot of those guys are, well, at least they were, when they made the movie, were still alive. So there's a really interesting story that goes with that. The captain got court-martialed, um, and, uh, which a lot of the crew thought was very, very unfair. But then for years and years and years, he never went to the reunions, because he just didn't know how people would feel about it. And then um, finally, after years, he went to a reunion in Indianapolis, and when he walked in, the entire, um, they all stood up. Wow. Yeah, why, did, so why, did, have been. why did he get court-martialed? Um, the the rules were you're supposed to, you were supposed to zigzag to to avoid Japanese uh, torpedoes and and they instead of that he decided to just put the pedal to the metal and get the hell out of there because they were out there by themselves no air cover or anything else and uh, and they got torpedoed by a Japanese submarine but interestingly they brought the the Japanese captain was uh, came and testified to the court martial and basically said look I would have it didn't matter. I would have sunk him anyway. Really? But they they court martialed him anyway, and uh, there's a whole bunch of interesting stories that go with that. Um, uh, I know. Yeah, and then he actually commits suicide. Um, oh no! Yeah, and many years later, the Congress passed a resolution exonerating him. But what was really interesting is that the Navy actually, um, uh, the the vice chief vice. Uh, CNO of the Navy, Chief Naval Operations, went to testify, and the Hill was actually saying, "Well, we don't think you should." we should reverse this. And the guy that worked for him who wrote his testimony was the, the last commander of a USS Indianapolis. It was a submarine that had been uh, decommissioned. And, and that guy was now the personal assistant to the Admiral. And he knew all those Indianapolis veterans because they all came to his decommissioning ceremony. And he felt so strongly about this that he, he wrote the testimony for the Admiral saying, well, you know, the Navy's right. Then he called up the congressional staffers that were that were prepping their members for the testimony and said, here's a list of all the questions that we don't have good answers for. <laughs> so what is wow. They <laughs> just hammered his boss with all these questions the boss couldn't answer. Well, so. you'd think after all that, that that would be the last thing they would do is try to go after one of the captains. But, I mean, I don't know. It's It seems, you know, really uh, sad, but that's the way it but, is. But, I mean, I just look. I mean, just every day when you wake up, there's, there's people wearing a uniform that are defending you, and, and we should just all be thankful for that. That's, That's, I need a donut. That is for sure. Yeah. Hey, by the way, so is, do you have anything to say at all about Hillary Clinton's uh, Trump intimidates me speech? I mean, her foreign policy speech? Look, I mean, you know, first of all, in foreign policy, people think that their candidate is going to be good on foreign policy. So a, I don't think a big foreign policy debate moves the needle very much. I, I think she had two choices. One is... You know, he's never going to out her. So she could have got up there and give, like, an uberly wonky speech that nobody would have cared about. And But but it, it, I think it would have just reinforced the thing that, hey, I know a lot about foreign policy. In, in, instead, she chose the opposite course, was, which is to basically kind of, you know, do a street brawl with, with him and kind of argue it on his level, which is, I think, riskier because... It, it gives away her one advantage, which is I can sound way wonkier than you are, and and now she's essentially kind of trading things with him. I I don't see how that. I mean, I, that's not the, yeah. the strategy necessarily. I would have picked. I'm not even sure why are you making a big foreign policy speech now. Um, 
you know, when you haven't even sewn up the thing in California yet. I mean, so right. I, 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 I don't understand it from a, you know, like, again, I don't, I'm not picking sides, you know, I'm just saying this to, if you want to, to do something, I'm not. I don't understand why you did that when you did it. Particularly did when it, it seems but. to be. I, I, I'm. I'm sorry. I don't think that she was the Secretary of State, but foreign policy seems to be her weakest uh, point. I don't well, know. Well, of course, that's the other. I mean, that's the other argument is. Hey, you want to talk about? If you want to talk about foreign policy, then you know, there's plenty of of years of Obama foreign policy of which Clinton was a part of to criticize and and then it becomes all about her and all about Obama which is a, a risk that you take so yeah you know, all right well listen thanks for your reminder uh in terms of I love I love your history lessons and I love your dedication to our soldiers and our armed forces buddy it's always great and and we i love it when you get into these backstories on things it's fantastic and turning us on so uh, is there a way for me to see the films from the gi film festival is there some website or something where i could go or no i mean they just screen them for the festival and then and then it kind of goes back to whatever the filmmakers are want to do some of them are going to have them be broadcasted some of them are uh trying to and screen them and different stuff i mean what you can always do is you can go to the the g i film festival website you can just google it and you can email them and ask them you know hey how how can I see this film and they could put you in contact with the filmmaker and and Okay. Uh, thing. But I was I was a judge. I mean, I know this because I was a judge on the film festival this year, and so I watched all the films. And without a doubt, that was the Indianapolis film was one of the most moving ones. The other one that was really super interesting was apparently in Switzerland. There, the Swiss had a prisoner of war camp, and if Americans got into Switzerland, they just didn't give them back. They they stuck them in a prisoner of war camp, and apparently conditions in that camp in Switzerland were actually pretty gruesome. And and uh, uh, so the, talking to the the survivors of this uh, POW camp in Switzerland, it's kind of an untold story of service and sacrifice in World War II. Wow, love it! All right, Jimmy. Well, listen, enjoy your weekend, and we appreciate you as always, friend. So, buddy, next week I'm going to be in Hong Kong. Oh, so I'll see you after that. What What are you doing in uh, in Hong Kong? I'm going to Hong Kong to to brief the government of Hong Kong on terrorism. Wow. I want a, a terrorism expert to come over and talk to him. Watch so I'm going to do Chinese. that. <laughs> and then I'll, I'll see you guys the following week, okay? All right, brother. Well, have fun. Send us some pictures of the uh, stewardesses. Okay, deal. What, what are you flying on? I, I don't know. I haven't looked. All right. All if, right. It's, if it's Korean air, make sure you, you send me some pics. You got a deal. All right. Okay, buddy. All right. Bye. It's Jimmy Carafano. Have a good